one thing may, which we've been saying, and it may sound very straightforward actually. It may sound very simple and straightforward. But, but as you dive in deeper into that, you may find there's a great unfolding that may naturally unfold. So when I ask you, what is all of this for? Is it God for me? Is it or is it me for God? It's very beautiful also to contemplate because truly if it is me for God, which actually means that I want to be in service to God's light. Me, whatever I think of me or whatever I take myself to be still, that then has to be in service to God's light. Then whose problem is your freedom now? So you can no longer be rushing and feverish for something which is not for you. Notice the feverishness is always about the me. But if it is truly me for God, take me, replace me, whatever your prayer may be, then it is God's business as to how that has to happen because what's it to you anyway? <coughs> it is up to God to use. The instant we change the paradigm, then the spiritual ego has no chance to survive. And if it still feels like I have a certain feverishness towards freedom, enlightenment, whatever spiritual concept we may have, nirvana, moksha, then it's still talking about moksha for myself. If it is truly about God's light and spreading God's presence in the world, whatever this play is, then there's no need for you to panic or rush. So what is this really about? What is this really about? We already say that we are fully surrendered to God's will. Fully surrendered to God's will. What is our business now? And does full surrender mean the doership or also the experiencership? Is it the Tom Karta Mai Bhukta, which is you are the doer but I am the experiencer? Or is it that you are the doer and the experiencer? It is none of my business and, and this me then has no legs to really stand on and cannot survive for much.
check in for yourself and examine if there is a sort of rushing a sort of pushing which are just indicators that you are looking for a god assisted life and not a god dictated one feel still some resistance towards the notion of a god dictated life it's okay there's no no judgment it's okay thank you just to clarify there's no intellectual resistance but there's a behavioral mm. habit mm. so uh, just for example you said about bhukta right so if somebody praises me for something the immediate ego like the dog lapping up the praise starts mm. okay but now i'm able to say you know go into a different say you know it's different yeah. but the initial reaction is still the dog lapping it up good to notice god dictated life is completely fine How many of you feel like God's will is now palpable? Yes. Yeah, so let me break it down further. So, one way to look at God's will is that it's happening anyway. It is unfolding anyway. So whatever is unfolding is God's will, is Guru Kripa ke valam. All that is true. And yet. in god's light in god's presence there may be something some guidance that comes okay. so that guidance is the highest way to meet god's will because that presence is the most beautiful way very intimate way to meet god and that guidance which comes usually in the form of a silent whisper is to me god's will and the trust to follow that is true surrender so when nanak ji said so kum rajai chalna then he could have also just said that just accept everything that you that is unfolding as god will and i'm sure somewhere he said that <coughs> but again and again it is pointed out that we must follow god's will which is independent of accepting the what the perceptual realm is bringing to us and then the question of course to be asked is what is this god's will and most people will say i don't know what is god's will and for them it's fine to say except what was unfolding in the world is god's will but you have access to god you have access to god's light you have access to god's presence mm-hmm. father god and will. it is not one second my dear i just finished it is not as if it is unknown to you anyway so many of you say i didn't want to come to such thing or somewhere but i just went because i had to go what is that your mind was resisting it was saying no 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 and yet you followed something greater which you found a calling for in your heart although you may not yet recognize it as that 
So the same intuitive insight which can guide you in terms of what your true nature is. That same intuitive insight can also make God's will, the hukum, so to speak, apparent to us. But independent of whether something becomes apparent in that way or not, as you are living in the apparency of God's light, in the apparency of self-knowledge, it is in allowing that to, allowing the presence to move whatever you think you are, whether that is the universe or whether that is one body, allowing that very presence to move yourself. is also to follow, follow the will of God. But to keep believing the content of your thoughts, the limited ideas about who you are, to live in the ego shadow, to suffer from it and then call that God's will is okay for those who have no meeting with God that has happened. It's okay maybe provisionally for those who are not meeting God in this way in their heart. So in that way we avoid getting into any sort of Advaita excuses for still taking ourselves to be that which we are, which clearly has been shown to us that we are not. It is only then that life becomes simple. In our mind, life is very unsteady, unstable. In your mind, today you like me, tomorrow you won't. Or maybe today you don't like me, tomorrow you will. It's all unsteady. But only in your heart can you be truly guided. <clears throat> so all conclusions of the goodness or badness of anything <clears throat> can only be determined <coughs> in the light of God, not in the light of our intellect, not in the light of our judgment. So the biggest absurdity would be that to be pointed in your heart in a particular way, to be pointed in your heart in a particular way, and then to take it to, suppose in our paradigm, maybe we have the paradigm that there's a lower court and a higher court. So you get a judgment from a lower court, and then you take it to the high court and say, I want to appeal this judgment. So how do we do that? It's all mixed up, isn't it? Where we may feel something, we may feel the wrong word, but intuit something in our heart. But to oppress that under a mental judgment saying, no, no, it can wait till tomorrow. I have some important work to finish. is then to take it to the wrong court of appeal and to use your intellect as the arbiter for good and bad or better and worse and still give your mind the dominance in this life which I have recently been calling the living in the world of the ego shadow so 
your heart is present god's presence is here i've often said who's been sitting in your living room as you've been searching for god all over the world your very presence that which you call i am the presence of that is never away from you and this is the literal meeting that i want us all to have not a hypothetical discourse on spirituality a literal encounter with yourself which is actually the simplest thing the world what is simple is undervalued and it feels like but it can't be this you see how many have come to this presence and said ah is that it is that it because you don't need to do any mental gymnastics you don't need to have a special degree for this I think there is no prerequisite to meet God. So the mind is completely unbelievable. Just here, just here. So the mind's whole trick is to convince you that the presence that you experience is a, for you as a limited entity, a me. that's the main trick nobody says no i am not present but between i am and i am something they have not made any room <coughs> so as soon as that i am becomes but i am something something so we never leave ourselves in the human condition un- uninfected with this somethingness and to leave ourselves uninfected by this something else is to come into god's presence or god's light you cannot do it any other way you cannot hold on to something and meet your presence you can experiment with this if you want and the hypnosis of thought the apparency of your limitlessness of your being seem lost okay. and seem lost is in our condition as good as being lost so no point becoming all this thing about saying oh but nothing really happens it only seems seems is designed to seem is <laughs> it is well designed to seem and the seeming in that particular state seems like a being although nothing truly happened to your being there is such beauty in the design of this maya this leela that the seeming is as good as that is why the job in satsang is urgent because although it is all a great seeming the seeming is very intricate and can seem seem real so all of you as my children i want to request you implore you plead with you saying you have access to this access to this 
reality the light of god's presence don't accept living under the ego shadow for even a moment accept that and in spite of that the play of maya the play in this leela is so strong that inevitably for a moment or two here and there you will buy into those notions but the instant that you smell that misidentification the instant you smell that you are taking yourself to be something snap out of it return home so what i'm pointing to is really very very simple but of course the ego hates it because here now what has happened and there is no room for story there is no room for any sort of narrative there is no room or value for conceptual knowledge that you may have picked up and most importantly or most strongly there is no room for you being right the right and wrong have now been given away to a higher power wouldn't be wouldn't it be a shame if you came to the most pristine possibility in the universe that is the meeting with god but you rejected it because you thought it's going to be a different way or you thought your life will change in a different thing would that be a great absurdity so examine and notice for yourself what stops you have you made a mental category have you said this is within god's bounds but this is not do you have an idea of practical or family <coughs> or work some notion like that which is just a pride which says no god cannot handle that aspect and actually uh, that pride only hides the fear that we don't want what he may do to that aspect we don't want what he may do to that aspect that is what is called an attachment I hand over everything to you, God. But just that tiny circle, please leave to me because I don't trust your intelligence to handle that. Is it? And, uh, and frankly speaking, the examples that you've given us in the past make us very scared. Is it? When we read the scriptures or old stories of Ram and Raja Hari Chandra or Jesus or. if i am or whatever we may be they don't inspire much confidence in us god to be able to hand it over to you can we meet that fear can we meet that fear and accept it first and say that this is where my boundary is so it takes us away from the lip service spirituality which i've been ranting against for a few weeks now and i'm very happy that in a way all of us have made that claim that our life is god's our life is guruji's we made that claim but when we're truly looking we might have some small or large <laughs> circles where we are scared of that handover 
But because we made that claim, then our pride won't let us also drop that that easily. So, in the not dropping it because of pride and the meeting it in your heart, there's a great dissonance which is forming. For many of you, I'm seeing that. That means satsang is being heard, and I see also on some of the messages that I get on Discord that truly this message is being heard. We are moving away from just the lip service, feel good, self-help type spirituality to a true fire. So when this dissonance happens between our claims and what we are truly finding, when the dissonance happens that our heart is pointing in a different way but our head is scared, then let that fire burn. So, um, when this dissonance happens between what our heart is pointing us and what our head wants, this is very good, this is exactly the fire that I am trying to burn. And as you are burning in this fire, of course you won't enjoy it. <laughs> you see, I have to light it stronger if you are still enjoying it. You see? Because if you are still saying, yes, let it burn further, then I feel like, okay, I need to ramp it up a bit more. <laughs> There's more room. <laughs> so, so, uh, but it's good. But it's good to let the burning happen because this is impossible that the truth may burn. It is not possible that the truth may burn. So, as the burning is happening, Recognize that only the false can be burnt. Or tell me that the truth can be burnt. <laughs> so as you recognize that only the false can be burnt, what is happening? It is creating more space for more burning. So we are expanding on the fireplace by giving the room for the fire to burn. So that is why you also notice that I'm not trying to reassure you too much in these days, um, satsangs. The idea is not to put this fire out, but to really allow it to burn. Because all that can be burnt is our ego, it is our pride, it is our selfishness. It is all these aspects of the ego mind. to speak about another thing which I've noticed as I've shared the contemplations with all of you. And it's a natural reaction, so I'm not I'm not placing blame or pointing out anyone in particular. But I noticed that there is a tendency to avoid the contemplation in the form of a sort of a higher insight. So, and I'm completely okay with that, as long as you feel that you're doing it with integrity and you're spending your life in that way, or is it, or is it only during the two minutes of the contemplation that you become so Advaita? So examine for yourself like that. If you feel like you're being in integrity to yourself, the truth, Is what I'm saying is that many times because we're scared of the fire, we may try to say big, big, big things. Yeah? Yeah. But if somebody asks us for 50 rupees more, the cab guy asks for 50 rupees more, then all those big, big things go out the window. So then we should uh, avoid that kind of convenient Advaita. <coughs> if it is truly like that, then it is completely fine. In fact, then it is music to my ears. So 
the whole project in a sense is to burn out all the fuel for your mind, for your ego, the project, so that you can live trusting God's light, live in the presence of God. To recognize that selfishness actually is an attack on, is a mind attack on God. Selfishness is to attack the truth of oneness and to claim a separation. So as I continue on this never-ending depth of discovery of God, of the Father, I feel to take as many of you along to have is a little bit of trust, that's all. Because what I'm pointing is very simple. It's just simpler than simple actually. If it is not lip service that you want to serve the truth and you don't want to serve want the truth to serve you then what I'm pointing is very, very simple. One, one thing you could examine is whether you want what should happen once you achieve this so-called freedom. What should happen? That itself will tell you the direction of your nose in a sense. Isn't it? Are you following the scent of your spiritual ego or the perfume of God? If in coming to the truth you have been the victim of wrong marketing and you realize that in coming to the truth all your mind's worst fears actually come true, you still want the truth. At which place? Do you draw your boundary? So contemplation like that completely changes the paradigm of the selfish spirituality or the self-serving spirituality which is Oh, I came to God's presence, so I am so much at peace and my friends are all asking me, what's happened to you? 
you will become so peaceful. What is it? What are you going to leave your house, become a sadhu? If all of that sounds like, ah, that sounds nice, that sounds cool, is it? then we are still stuck in God helping me or God fulfilling my projections, my goal projections of myself. And you can never gauge these things from the actions or the outcomes which are perceivable. You can only smell the fragrance in your heart. consequences have played out, there is no guilt or regret, then generally speaking that probably happened with intuition and in God's light. I, mean, yeah. I, I know I don't want to come up with a rule, but yeah. Yeah. generally speaking. Yes. Gen have a report but Yes. So, uh, we can also maybe move this around to see if that helps the online audience. The mic is from there, don't have to do anything. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to thank you from the heart, it was very beautiful satsang. And it really, it's almost like unlocking a key for me because for a long time um, I always felt like the presence I could feel and I was like I'm experiencing the presence. But I've internalized and now that it's the presence, yeah. experiencing the presence. Yeah. Right, so the, so the, or the body and other things are their sensations, yes. but effectively it's the presence is experiencing yeah. itself and experiencing yeah. the mind yeah. within it. Exactly. And, and that's actually, um, uh, it's, uh, release a lot of discord yes. because when you're also the person trying to find the presence yes. uh, you get focused on the sensations within the body and you're in dissonance because the, the person can never find the presence so you get or you're always in a kind of state of dissonance and disharmony right. but when you let the mm, just rest in as presence looking at presence the, the, the beauty is just yes. is amazing just thank you, thank you for that. Thank you. And, and it's also, you know, as you said, things just play out. I was supposed to be in a meeting at this time, but then the meeting got rearranged and I came to the place I wanted to be. So it's, you know, it's just, you don't know how things are, um, keep manifesting. Uh, but in this whole present uh, situation also, you feel like since you can feel your body as an appearance in the self, and then all the senses are subordinate to the body, right, yes. because they play through the mind, yes. which is in the body, yes. all of it can be discarded, right, because if you're manifesting the sense of the, the, the mind itself, yes. everything else that's subordinate to it, yes. like the vision and everything, yes. can all be packaged into that, yes. that thing that's manifesting within you. Yes. In an attempt to help whom? Um, well, it has to be, I mean, it's, I mean, the experiencer is, is the self, the experiencer is the self. So, just, just a little bit of vigilance for you, because the, the spiritual ego can hang on to even the slightest branch. You see, your report is very good for you, but I'm just spelling so that there's no chance of uh, any of that happening, which means that uh, when we say it can be discarded so that I don't trouble myself anymore or what? 
Well, um, yeah, um, I was just saying that. No, I got it. Yeah, no, I was, I was what I was saying. I think uh, the insight well, for me was that the appearances of the world, yeah. the appearances, yeah. then are part of the. Uh, are also all packaged into the appearance yeah. of the body, which can be felt. Yeah. When I see sight, yeah. um, I can't feel that it's virtual. Yeah. But when I can feel, I can within myself, I can feel this, the the body. Yeah. I can feel that it's virtual and it's manifesting, and I can feel the, I can feel the play of manifestation within the piece. But this, I, this is difficult to discard because this seems absolute. It just seems like, okay, I'm seeing all this. But the insight was that all this is nested within the body. So if you discard the body, then you're also discarding its, you know, its clothing, which is the senses. Yeah. That was just it. That's what I did. It hadn't occurred to me earlier. That's good. That's good. That's good to see. So as long as you are discarding, I wonder if still audible from here, it may not be. As long as you are discarding, then any um, uh, boxes you make, you see, which helps you lump up or clump up this entire world appearance into something and, and throw it into the ocean, <laughs> that is, it is good enough. You see. The, the method and the sequence is not that relevant, as long as you are nithing it over you, that is fine. get away from the mind to not go there. I try to let go of everything in language. Yeah. So when you say that guidance, yeah. God's will, could that also come in language or yes. should I discard that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So till you have a doubt about where it is coming from, keep discarding everything. Mm -hmm. Keep discarding everything. Then you will come to a point where the words or the guidance from the heart will be so clear that it is coming from a different space than the mind. Okay. <coughs> then you can follow. Also, I have given you various tools to check on this. So, that guidance which comes to you as you are completely aware or as the who you really are is apparent to you, okay, that guidance you can trust. Because the mind can never give you that insight. Okay. So, when you are operating intuitively, then that may come. But if that all that sounds a bit confusing, for now let go of all words. There is no rush. Beautiful thing we read yesterday it just came to me. Mm. Oh, can we read some more of this actually? Okay. So, some excerpts I'm reading from the reading notes. The first is if you choose, you can push me away. But if you do not push me away, understand that I am going to see this job through. Whatever suffering it may cost you in your earthly life, whatever inconceivable purification it may cost after your death, whatever it costs me, I will never rest. Nor let you rest. Many of you can relate to that. <laughs> Until you are literally perfect. Until my father can say without reservation that he is pleased with you, as he said he was well pleased with me. This I can do and will do, but I will not do anything less. Okay, so these are um, beautiful words from a book by C.S. Lewis, um, Mere Christianity. What um, struck me was the beauty of the words, I will not do anything less. Because for one who has found God, 
to offer you other provisional things because otherwise it may hurt your ego okay. it's a big time cop out <laughs> okay. so so i would rather in a way yeah, i would not want to hurt any of you but if hurting you provisionally is what it takes to get you to the recognition of the highest then i can unfortunately or fortunately not offer you anything less so so these are very beautiful words uh, whatever suffering it may cost you in your earthly life why is whatever suffering it may cost you in the earthly life how is that acceptable isn't that unfair isn't that unfair you know don't you happen to feel that it's yeah, so this is that this is talking about yes, that yes i'm saying that you yes. see the faith and you feel yes. you know that you recognize that yeah. so it's it's to just go on your ego you way and it doesn't initially we feel like such thing yes and also it's important to consider earthly life makes up what of our true life i was going to say what percentage but even percentage is not applicable no? so in other whatever suffering it may cost you in your earthly life and you basically saying it is still worth it because there must be a greater life somewhere no? and i'm not saying after death and all that. i'm saying right now so in suffering in fact is the nature of the ego shadow which is the very nature of the ego shadow and if that is happening but you're finding your way into god's presence into the truth of who you are still worth it because that earthly life is really non existent anyway still my it's a bit for and when he's talking about whatever inconceivable purification it may cost you after death because we don't know <laughs> that is the great unknown so is basically making an invitation to become open to truly surrender and to trust i will never rest now let you rest yes <laughs> i'm going to let you rest as long as long i can't force you to be in satsang but as long as you come and you listen i'm going to make it uncomfortable for you as much as you will let me which which is completely contrary to the world's idea of coming to satsang okay. we struggle and we are so we are so much in anger and frustration and resentment and all of these things in the world so i come to satsang for solace now he said he is saying here also he is going to trouble us so this is the beautiful example of satsang is the medicine which only half taken will cause more problem so he went to a doctor for diarrhea for example <laughs> it is egotism no that is the satsang when you go to satsang and if you only half take half dosage compared to what the doctor has said the egotism will only expand and that version of the ego none of you will ever want to have which is the spiritual ego because you'll be so right about everything that you will not you'll suffer more than everyone else you become so right about everything you know so much that you'll suffer more than everyone else and you won't even be able to express the suffering because your image of your spirituality you will have to keep up okay, and we've seen a few of those in the last 10 to 12 years what happens when they half in hell this drug like, yeah i know it now i know it <laughs> i can i can see like that we can get into that trap and then we don't even realize because the words are all the same 
But then what happens when suffering comes, then you have to keep it inside because I can't show it because I am supposed to be free, you know. <laughs> so these kind of troubles, they come. So satsang is that medicine which if you stop midway, you know, more than antibiotics, if you stop this midway, <laughs> it's going to cause more trouble. The initial symptoms will be exaggerated. So you have to fully, fully accept and fully take this medicine, especially when it seems unacceptable. That is when the reminder that what can burn is very important. What can burn? Of course, we will resist this often. It's not a bed of roses and I'm not saying at all that it is. But I'm just saying that it's not meant to be. And if something is not getting ignited in this, you see, then either you're taking what is being offered here and turning it into your own mold mentally before taking it, or you're not really listening to what is being shared. Because I'm asking that you chop off your own head. <coughs> And this is more little to more difficult to do than you chopping off the head of your body because I have no use for your physical head. No? This is more difficult to do because it is taking everything that you didn't want to happen, <coughs> opening yourself to the possibility of it happening. Everything that you think you're so right about, it could turn out that you don't know anything at all that head, that pride and people will give up a hundred physical lives for that kind of pride that is the pride that I want to chop it doesn't seem like pride at all to you it seems like me <laughs> it seems like me you know? so really I am asking for your head me, it seems like me it seems like it is you, it is not your pride it is you, there is a you there who wants and does not want. Is it? What right do you have to want or not want? What right do you have? Who are you to want or not want? These words can have an ouch in them and they are meant to. What makes you special that God is there but you can want? If God is here, what I can say, so that claim can only be made after oneness is realized, but oneness can only be realized when God's will is first fully followed. Wouldn't we love to just get straight to that oneness and say, but I am God, I can make a claim along with Him, because I have rights. <laughs> You don't because you don't exist. Why am I able to say all of this? Because I know that that one doesn't exist. That is why the ego doesn't have its like dark light or something. It is just a shadow. A shadow doesn't really exist. But but in this play, it can seem like it casts something on the ground, and our knowledge, our righteousness, is all of that. <coughs> claims of the non-existent one, the shadow of the non-existent one. So whatever suffering it may cost you in your earthly life, that is what it means. What what can make us suffer? That which we are holding on to tightly. Like that. So when someone says, open your hand, open your hand, open your hand, it can feel like they are hurting you. They try to make you open. It may feel like they are hurting you. Why are you doing this to me? This is not what I signed up for. <laughs> but you know in your heart somewhere that this is the right medicine to take. So this was very nice. Then very nice one. Um, from Anna Amapurani. How do you pronounce her name? Anna Purani. Um, Anna Purani. Achha, achha. Okay. So, um, she said, the Guru is a thief really. <laughs> he is waiting to loot you. 
to rob you of your very being your identity i feel like the being could be um a mistranslation or something but that's okay of your very being your identity what we take to be our very existence no? what we take to be our very being our identity <coughs> but so what what do you have that is really yours mm-hmm. what do you have that is really yours what is what and if he robs you of that is that in service to you or a disservice to you hmm? what exploring <laughs> then she says and never forget how much he loves you he waits for you eagerly but he works only if you hold him as your very life breath and once you do you realize he is tireless is he the very different cultures very different tradition and somehow it happened i don't know if pratna planned it this way but very similar to what the first passage was <coughs> that he is tireless so, so earlier jesus said that he will not rest <laughs> till it is done he is tireless even the gods in their temples need their sleep but not the guru temple sanctums close at noon but the guru works around the clock don't judge him by his appearance his grand clothes or the absence of them his success or the absence of it incidentally this is one sage who doesn't wear clothes huh? doesn't wear clothes so she um, that's why she's talking about the grand clothes or the absence of them his success or the absence of it his fancy lifestyle or the absence of it you exist because of his compassion he is the only one in the universe who is willing to take on your karma no one else will you see if you notice earlier also jesus has said that whatever it cost me i will never rest once you have surrendered you need not go in quest of him he will come to meet you and even if this is what we started satsang with today where i said once it becomes me for god and then not god for me then god rushes to you till you are rushing to god because you want something out of him god will seem elusive once the true surrender happens that replace me take me use me as you will let that will be done guru kripa ke balam then there is no waiting because god is waiting for that invitation Let's skip Master Osin. This because it seems a bit long, a bit intimidating to read so much. But um, the next one: uh, never desire special praise or love, for that belongs to God, who alone has no equal. Never wish that anyone's affections be centered in you. Nor let yourself be taken up. with the love of anyone but let jesus be in you and in every good man be pure and free within entangled unentangled with any creature you must bring to god a clean and open heart if you wish to attend and see how sweet the lord is truly you will never attain this happiness unless his grace prepares you and draws you on so that you may forsake all things to be united with him alone a beautiful book um, called the imitation of christ okay what i opened this for was one uh, this one which was very nice because in one small passage um this is from sanai of afghanistan who was rumi ji's teacher for some time before shams so he says humanity is asleep humanity is asleep concerned only with that what is useless humanity is asleep concerned only with that which is useless living in a wrong world so very clearly he has spelled out the problem humanity asleep 
living in the ego shadow in the ego shadow we are concerned only with that which is temporal spatial which will die this really pointless you see so we are concerned only with that which is useless because we are living in the wrong world beautiful so one very very atomic line now this is very nice he says believing that one can excel this is only habit and usage not religion believing that one can excel is only habit and usage not religion have you ever heard something like excel excellence is what the world is chasing even at spirituality we want to excel but notice that the mind's mantra is what this do this this will be better this is how your life can become better you can become better come to spirituality you will become better so this betterment is towards an idea of excellence which actually seems very beautiful but actually is an idea which is talking about a competition with god because the, because it is the imitation of god in that way not in a good way like imitation of christ really yeah. in a bad way trying to the ego's game plan is to take up god's role god's position and have control over this life yeah. and it does that in the attempt to chase excellence through worldly and useless things yeah. now um, jyotima answered this well but when he says usage what do you feel is talking about this is a not this is habit and usage not religion yeah? what is he saying usage of god god usage of god exactly so we are attempting to use god it is god for me see which is a misuse of religion actually it is not a true religion this religion which means that he is not pointing out at a particular religion he is only saying that when we attempt to use god for ourselves exploit god in this way rather than serving ourselves up to empty ourselves up to god then this religion is inept then do not prattle before the people of the path <laughs> rather consume yourself i love this line don't prattle before the people of the path and don't waste time in useless conversation and intellectual understanding and you know this and tell me that and this and this consume yourself consume yourself beautiful he says you have an inverted knowledge and religion if you are upside upside down in relation to reality so if you take the unreal to be real and the real to be unreal and make our conceptual frameworks on the basis of this inverted understanding then all our notions and religions will be inverted isn't it? so our personal philosophies is what he is talking about if you invert the very structure on which your belief system is created then obviously your beliefs will be upside down so man is wrapping his net around himself a lion which is the man of the way bursts his cage asunder so this is what humanity is doing what is the whole paragraph it is the situation no he called it the situation so what is he saying the human condition is that we continue to wrap this net around ourselves mm-hmm. till the master comes and blows his cage up blows the prison up and it is a mental prison so beautiful i feel like so much potency in this four five line is very very beautiful I like this one also. Mira said, um, she posted that one day Rabia is sitting inside her hut. It is early morning, and Hasan came to see her. And the sun is rising, and the birds are singing, and the trees are dancing. It is re- it is a really beautiful morning, and he calls forth from outside, Rabia, what are you doing? What are you doing inside? Come out. God has given birth to such a beautiful morning. what are you doing inside yeah, so he makes a fair request he says what are you doing inside come out god has given birth to such a beautiful morning 
what are you doing? And she says, and Rabia laughs and she says, Hassan, outside is only God's creation, inside is God himself. Why don't you come in? Yes, the morning is beautiful, but it is nothing compared with the creator who creates all the mornings. Yes, those birds are singing beautifully, but they are nothing compared to the song of God. That happens only when you are within. Why don't you come in? Are you not yet finished with the without? Are you not yet finished with the without? With the outside? When will you be able to come in? Excel, yes, yes, yes. Exactly what I'm saying, my dear, that if you came to satsang and you just had such a nice time and no blind spots, no darkness was made visible to you, then be quite a useless satsang. So if you're coming and you're noticing, ah, yeah, I see this, you see, then if there are mistakes as you call them, would you rather that they not be pointed out or would they, that they would be pointed out in spite of the burning they cause along? Mm-hmm. I think it's good that they are They are good that they are pointed out but keep the, the feeling in your heart it is good because then this vessel is being made worthy for God. Not so that you become a better something. Me for God. There is guilt and shame that comes in. Yes, but that is the misunderstanding of this. So, when, very good, very good, thank you for pointing that out. So, when you notice that there is an error in our ways, you see, does that mean that that error will get corrected by doing more error? So, can guilt and shame be created independent of the mind? So, if the error is that we follow the mind's way, the ego's way and not God's will, then by continuing to follow it more, by following falling for guilt and shame and unworthiness, see, isn't that the same as falling for pride? Because both are mental and they take you to be that one that does not exist. So, first don't say that there is guilt and shame. <laughs> that is also mind trick. There is. No, there isn't. You have to work for it with your belief, with your identification. Guilt is never free. And this is another version of upside down. That which is highest is available for free with no work. (laughs) But it seems like guilt, shame, pride, resentment, remorse, all of these things. They we feel like those just come, they are available for free. No, you have to work for it. Because guilt is not just some feeling that can just come like anger. 
For guilt, you also have to think. You have to take yourself to be the doer. Can you be guilty without taking yourself to be the doer? You have to first take yourself to be an individual, then that individual has doership. All of this hard work you have to do for guilt. For God, nothing. You just sit. Not even sit, you can stand, you can lie down. <laughs> so it's another one of the upside down paradigms. We may say that there is. No, there isn't. We work for it. Suffering needs a lot of work. God needs no work. Suffer effortlessly. You can suffer effortlessly. Like I show you my magic trick which is God is here effortlessly. Now you show me yours. <laughs> suffer effortlessly. I need your help to do something. No, no, you follow what I'm saying first. God is here effortlessly, yes? Yes or no? Now you show me, you suffer like this also, before the sound is a click. Suffer. Suffer, suffer fast. <laughs> that was some kundalini or something. <laughs> suffer. Can you? You can't do it. Because suffering needs a lot of work. First you have to believe yourself to be limited. You have to believe yourself to be an individual. You have to take yourself to be a body. You have to believe that this body has autonomy. You have to believe all kinds of rubbish before you come to a point of suffering. So only God just is. You can only say there is God. We never say there is something else. No, that is created by hard work. Hard work of using the mind, using the power of belief, identification. That's why ultimately, you know, they say truth will prevail because everything else will make you tired. Only truth cannot make you tired because it's effortless. See, for everything else you have to make effort, no? You have to think this, you have to think that. Okay. Uh, ultimately, truth will only prevail because energy is limited in the human condition. You will get tired of your suffering. You get tired of your hard work. Yeah. In Orthodox Church, yeah. the priests are preaching this fear of God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but how is that relevant to what I'm saying? <coughs> I, I don't you want to fix that? I don't want to fix the church or anything, yeah. but I don't think there is anything in me that is afraid of God. Yeah. It's okay. Why remove it? We stop being afraid of the world first. But when I say I am so much in awe of God every day more and more. It includes in <coughs> what the world may say, call many feelings actually. There's a feeling of wonder, there's a feeling of like, I don't know how better to put it, but a sense of intimidation. All of that mixed together makes this like all. So it's okay. Feel whatever you want, but towards God. Not in the world. He'll take care of all of that. It's awesome. We're bound to have, if whatever aspect of ourselves still takes ourselves to be human in whatever way, is bound to be awestruck by the magnificence of that which is beyond name and form of that which to whom the universe is nothing, nothing at all.
Real good. After all, we are talking about one that is that one had fingers, but at the snap of a finger just changed the whole complexion of the entire universe. jump to conclusions, sometimes those things beyond our understanding can be very worthwhile to explore. manifest form. I mean, if you are skeptical then all this is nonsense, but suppose you are there and like on the battlefield it is said Krishna one day got very angry and he took out his Sudarshan chair. I promise you that all of us would be, our near knees would be knocking if you were to witness that. <laughs> so, we don't have to mold everything into our rationality in our, our limited experiences. The truth can be much vaster than our minds can imagine or give, give credit to it for. What are we finding? That there is a formless reality. There is a formless reality. <sighs> which on its surface, whatever surface would mean then, gives birth to beingness, consciousness which is limitless. <coughs> All this universe, you look in any direction, you look up in the sky, you look down <laughs> anywhere, it's limitless. You see, they've counted some, I don't know, millions of stars in the sky. I actually counted millions of stars in the sky that for whom this universe is nothing because he is beyond space and time. And we are trying to figure out what feeling would be right for us to feel towards him. <laughs> Can we first meet him? If such a meeting is possible, why would we not grab every opportunity, every moment to meet him? No, but we are still working on our feelings. <laughs> because all of this somewhere may be still sounding unreal. No? Like my kids would say, ah, just be normal. <laughs> Somewhere all of this must be still sounding like some fairy tale. Like I remember when I read Ashtavakra Gita first time, I felt it was like very, some very nice poetic work. Or even if it did sound like it must be real, I felt like I am never going to meet that kind of God anyway. So I just want some peace. I am going to do my Kriya, whatever. And I'm going to get peace by listening to these beautiful poetic words. But as you start to see that that is more real than the ground on which we are standing, 
all that takes substance in this universe takes substance on the substratum of god once you start to see the substratum as more valuable <coughs> than the surface in all these the game plan will change how can we expect that for whom the universe is a small firefly that to appear to us and not only appear to us then serve us and okay if we do accept that and expect that and still god makes it a possibility for us shouldn't we be so grateful in our heart come to grips <coughs> with what you're being pointed to <coughs> come to grips with what you're being pointed to in the immensity of that most of this stuff will just fade away it's not poetic words i'm saying this universe is nothing for, but a firefly for that reality that is your own reality but we say within that firefly there's a tiny grain of sand called me what should we do with that me first this is my eyes what are the maya can they be and by the way who is that one it is you but in your own design it is important to let go of the me before you realize that it is you and without emptying yourself without surrendering yourself completely you cannot jump over this step you see you finish kindergarten now uh, make me a doctor straight no first become anuman before you become ram nobody wants to do that only in lip service that is why at some level advaita can seem like a very convenient intellectual sort of pursuit but it isn't it squeezes our throat it squeezes every bit of egotism out of us true advaita not just some airy fairy classroom version this is when as we realize the immensity of intuitive insight the immensity of what you are discovering can feel scary and the imm- immensity of complete surrender can feel scary and if you're not even scared a little bit then you're not really meeting the immensity of it who are you meeting how can you meet that one is it so what happens is that in the mind we create some denial about this we create like a denial about this maybe like a thin layer of denial which makes it all seem like are you aware now yes i'm aware awareness is here huh? yeah, yeah, yeah like that but who is that awareness where does it live how are you making that discovery what is that lightless light in which your being itself is born how we don't want to explore that as much as we want to explore our feelings so our feelings we are familiar with now no 
they refuse anger greed lust fear what what we've done with them no is it what about that which is so beyond all this and it is the substratum of all of this maybe we don't take it literally enough literally your reality and if you really consider it to be your reality you would be obsessed by it see not just like oh two hours at some will be nice for me i needed to hear this today <laughs> this kind of stuff if you really took awareness to be your reality tell me what else you would spend time on but we don't because we don't take it literally enough we feel it's another experience like we went to a amusement park or something okay. or we went to a movie ah very nice <coughs> no you are that <coughs> you are that in which the universe is born you are that and you are worried about mosquitoes mosquitoes on the back of mosquitoes that is the, is what we are in relation to what we take <coughs> ourselves to be in relation to what we really are how is it possible are we taking it too like poetically or something ah there is one awareness then there is a beingness no it's you <laughs> you're talking about you much more than what you think you are you but this stuff this stuff is fading you can't even tell whether this is a dream right now all this stuff is fading even if there is a waking state which is not the dream state how long will it last any guarantee of tomorrow so find that which is stable before this unstable one disappears I tell you one more thing. Nobody has been able to solve the human condition. Nobody has been able to perfectly align their feelings, perfectly purify their thoughts, perfectly have a healthy body, fix all their relationships. Nobody. And we are not going to be do, able to do it either. Let's admit that and move towards reality instead of living in this, trying to solve Maya, which by design is unsolvable. We feel like spirituality will give us the ultimate tool to become the best. No, you have to become first, worse than the naked beggar on the road. fully fully surrendered in our humility we create the emptiness empty space for god to god's presence to reveal itself we will never be able to fool god with our words we will never be able to fool god with our words and you know words are not consistent okay. 
we feel that God hears us uh, only during our prayer, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, prayer starting. God is putting headphones on. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's not that. <laughs> our very being is made up of God. Everything comes in that, within that. There is nothing that God is not aware of. So prayer is the opportunity for us to surrender ourselves, to humble ourselves and to be open to hearing God, not to be open to creating a hotline with God. We pray so that we may be guided in our heart. This is why I, I love this, um, these words from Sanaya of Afghanistan. We got all upside down. And it will not become right by making it now mentally upside down again. You see, an inversion of the inversion will not make it straight. And you just change the source of all of this. Change the source of all of this. Mm-hmm. Right, we can have satsang for another 50 years and all of us still say me, 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 but what about me and me and me and me. Most of the world's spirituality is there to serve this me. I am not going to become party to that sham, scam. If you come here to help yourself, not to empty yourself, you are at the wrong place. If you want to die while you are still alive, you want to taste your own death and meet God, then I will sit at your feet and serve you in every way. Will there come a time where I will say God and you will say God? Or will it always be me saying God and you say but me? If I say God and you say God, if I mean God and you mean God, that is when we truly come to satsang. If I say God and you say, yeah, but me, and notice that your humblest yes, but, but still, all these things are just keeping you bound. Just keep you bound to the unreality.
always silly juvenile type metaphors coming, but it's coming, so I'll say it. So, <coughs> suppose your job was to just be with this space which is around you already. Yeah. So you had to be with the space which is already around you. Yeah. But you were thinking your job is to go there, get this, do this, do that, do that. And you've troubled yourself, you've tired yourself in all of that. But your job is just to be with this space which is around you. What is more effortful? More effort. To be with the space around you or to run after things, chasing them? Now, the funny thing is that our job is even simpler. The presence is just here, not even around you, it is just within you, you are made up of it, you can't escape it. It's the simplest thing to be in God's presence. But we make it difficult by chasing this and chasing that and trying to fix this and fix that. This simplicity we must learn to handle. You see, and in a way value. So this is the opposite of the world's value paradigm. In the world what we value the most is what is gained with the most difficulty. Guruji's example, one of his favorite examples is coming to me. And this actually you know happened to him, but uh, there's a short version is you say you are hungry. You say you are hungry, then you don't ask if it's gluten free, organic, keto, hypocrite. <laughs> you want God, here it is. You never said you want God but me. Because both are not possible. Today you pick one and go. Don't go without picking. What do you want? God or me? <coughs> At what cost? Whichever way we look at it, that is the only solution to this human condition.
Shavasana? Yeah, I do. It happens rarely that uh, I make a, like a very strong speech and somebody still has a question, but I'm happy to hear. And there was a point where <coughs> I felt stuck in a dilemmatic situation while meditating. Is that, uh, I, I could be wrong, but it's just my experience that I'm sharing. In its entirety, in the complete self, omnipresent thing that we call God, yes. that created these individual things to express itself or experience itself in so many languages. So we don't know exactly how many things are there. So, if we entirely dissolve this individual self, will it not be denying that only presents its very purpose of this entire yeah. dream? Yeah. So if it was that, then... It uh, felt that. Yes. So, I am saying that we cannot, we can never speculate about what God's intention is. No? So, given that we can't speculate about God's intention, what is the only other option to find out what is the true will of God? How will you find out? I would like to understand properly. Yes, yeah, so, so we can also share today's recording with you because we spent some time on this. But um, God's will is palpable and available to <coughs> us. You see, just in the presence of God, as you're being introduced to the presence, it is not an unintelligent presence. And if God's presence was just like a light bulb sitting over there, then we'd spend time with that light bulb only. Now, why do all these practices and all? <laughs> but because it's an intelligent presence, it's a guiding light, and also the creative light of this universe, okay, and that is why to come to God's presence and to, to encounter directly, to encounter face to face what is God's will, is much better than making first a presumption and then saying, but then would it not? Is it? Let's find out. Let's find out. Will it be same for each being or will, can there be a... It will not be the same for each being. It, it will not be the same for each being. All of us can be... Just like the author of the storybook or the novel can write and have guidance for every single character that he's writing. In the same way, God is available to guide us all. If God is not stuck in some time, I don't have time. <laughs> so very, very clearly you can be guided in your heart. So we don't need to meet it at a layer of abstraction which then um, systems of philosophy or religion at a broad level attempt to do by giving us sort of moralistic standards or this standard and that standard which no, nobody can ever agree on and keep changing with time. Instead of that, really the core of spirituality in all religion is to come and encounter God's will directly in our heart. Otherwise, everybody would not say, uh, follow the come, be a faithful servant of God. All religions, in fact, some of the religions are, are derived their name from following the will of God. Isn't it? So, why would they say that if they could just decode it and say, hey, this is, this is what it is. Do this. So, come to God's presence. Come to the light of your heart. At the first step, allow that to unfold without your individualistic intervention from the mind. See if the presence can move this world and to start with this body itself. You, like you were not here the other day when some uh, child asked me, can you hear God's will as words? Is it? I say, yeah, of course I can hear God's will as words. I am just sharing satsang. All I have to do is continue to share, but with my mouth closed. 
because these words are coming from God's light. And if they can come here, they can come everywhere. And this presence is so supremely intelligent that the instant this mouth is closed, the tone, texture, everything changes. If it's open like this, it seems to be different. And I have no idea what is going to come next. There is no planned speech approach, all of this which is being shared. I didn't know it's going to start coming. In fact, most things that get shared here, I've noticed that they get shared first, then other things about it start coming. And this is not saying this as if something special is happening here. I'm introducing you to your own possibility of living like this. The only trouble for your mind is that you want it to prove itself before you let go. You want God to prove itself, Himself, before you fully let go because you want to hedge your bets. That is not possible. What will happen? What is the worst case scenario? You leave your head, you start relying on your heart. What will happen? You make a big mess, what you already have. So what? Is the discovery of the timeless one worth it? That you bet one lifetime on it? It can seem like a big decision, actually it's nothing. Is the discovery of the eternal one enough to bet one lifetime of making a mess? You cannot get it unless you let go. If God needs to conform to your ideas about like this and like that and should be like this and look that, then you're still taking the mind to be God and you want God to be subservient to your intellect. But I have one question, what brings you here? So there are a million shops in this world which are offering God for you. Why you come to this shop where you are being asked to chop off your head for God? Why come to this place? Because you are hearing the call in your heart for truth and that requires that true openness, true emptiness. So something already is following that call and coming here. Dive in deeply into that call in your very heart. Nobody forces you to come. If all you wanted was a spirituality to make your life better, you can go to so many places.
they may even have some money back guarantees and things if you don't feel 500 grams of peace then your money is fully refunded making a joke to <laughs> here i'm saying i'm going to trouble you every day i'm going to make you uncomfortable If you came untroubled, I will give you trouble. When you if you came less troubled than you are now, huh? how do you come? It's the first day. She's still smiling. She's still to this stage. <laughs> And I'm literally asking, what makes you come? Follow that. What is the scent and the fragrance of that one? There's nothing in it for you. Somewhere in your heart, it rings true, like Nathan said. For the truth, somewhere it rings true. What is that? Where is that aspect of yourself where it rings true? I am not going to stop till you can with full integrity say that you are living in God's light. I am not going to rest, I am not going to stop. I am going to keep coming at the darkness of the ego relentlessly till you come over to my side. But I cannot force you to change your will. If you choose to be in denial, you can still come here and be in denial because you can be sitting in your mind, mishearing, <laughs> still wanting to be right. You can still do all of that. I do not have the power to get consciousness to change its will. But I will keep. Ranting and 
whispering and shaking and every available thing that I can use. to come into God's house. I feel like we will end here for today. Thank you all so much for <coughs> being in Satsang today. Sadhguru Shri Muji Baba Ki Sadhguru Shri Anantha Ki Guru Kripa Kevalam